next 10 minutes, I'll just tell you a little bit about my background and where I come from and so forth. Um, what we have on the video clip, it's just a training program that I worked with an athlete who had a history of a knee injury. And he came in for a four-week camp, and we're just going to look at a couple of the weeks, and I'll just stop it. And I'm not trying to reinvent anything, and I'm not trying to show you things that you haven't been doing and so forth. It just gives you a little bit of a perspective to say, an athlete has come in for a reconditioning camp for a couple of weeks, and here's some of the stuff we were doing. So my background as you're watching and so forth is that I was an ATC, graduated from Portland State College in New York, and I immediately went to a ski racing academy in northern Vermont. So we've got 13 to 18 year old athletes. They're there for uh, 10 months out of the year. They're competing uh, on snow. They're only there for skiing. So populations about anywhere from 70 to 80, 90 athletes and so forth. Right? And we've got them full time. They live there, they go to school there, they go home for a few weeks in the summer, about six weeks, but we see them anyway because we go skiing around the world. So there's my population that I got to play with as a young athletic trainer coming out of uh, uni. The difference was in my first year, I had nine season-ending ACL injuries, a femur fracture, a tip-fit fracture, and a meniscal and an MCL. So I mean, roughly, yeah, 12. 12 season-ending total knee injuries in my first year as an athletic trainer. They occurred within about a six-week time frame. So that's what I, that's how I learned. So that's how I kind of got my hands going and understanding of what this was about. The next year, it was nine total season-ending injuries that took place. So again, we had a problem based on my exercise science or whatever it might have been that I learned. I think we might have a problem. Still didn't understand the relationship between performance or what injury prevention really was. This is 89, 90, 91. And so all it meant was that they're training kids and kids are getting hurt. So it was pretty cool, it was job security, but the kids were wiped out. I was the only athletic trainer. And I had a room, just a quarter over here. That was it. Tiny little space, built two athletic training tables, um, had it on myself, bought all the stuff, right? The dining room, sanded up, did the whole thing. Tiny little space. That's what we had. Budget was about, I don't know, $5,000, $4,000 to buy medical supplies, tape, uh, and things like that. We had a small antique weight room and so forth, but we're on the side of a mountain. We had the outdoors. We had everything that we needed. That's where I began, and then I left about 14 years later. Still with a budget of somewhere around $5,000 annually, what we needed to buy some things. Yeah, there's some donors would give a lot of bits of kit here and there and some pieces of equipment. But it's still bands, pulleys, dumbbells, balls, little things, okay? Didn't have the luxury. That experience is very irreplaceable because the reality is, is you can do a lot with nothing. So it's a very simple approach. It can be very complex in its thought process, but its execution or by design, it can be very simple, okay? What I learned was coaching the entire time. I learned how to coach. And so all of a sudden, we had to say is, we have an injury problem. We need to start strength training them better. So they weren't getting the right kind of education in the strength training environment. So that's where the coaching came. So I got a CSCS, easy, okay, to get. What are you gonna do with it? And then we had to start doing some physiological testing. I started testing kids. Wingate testing, Berg testing, body count, and just start doing a lot of different things in season in order to try to figure out why we're still having so many of these injuries. Are they losing strength? Are they losing power in season and so forth? And they were, all right? So once we started tracking all this stuff for a year or two, and then we started putting in season strength training, not maintenance, but in the competitive season strength training programs, then we started reducing the injury rate. So it was a good program. So for the first, I was there for 12 years. For the first uh, six years, we averaged 3.5 ACLs a year over six years. Again, it's a population on an average of about 70 athletes. Right? The last six years, we averaged 0.5 ACLs for the final six years. We had a couple of years with none. We had one, maybe a year with two. Right? But we made a huge difference in reducing at least just the ACL rate. And that was the most common for alpine ski racers and so forth. Okay. From there, it was having a chance to go to a special conference uh, in, uh, outside of Chicago and so forth and met some really, really good people. But I was able to share how I was rehabbing elite, world-class Olympic ski racers at the time. Brandon and I was at an academy, but I started getting national team athletes that would come in. 
And the philosophy was that this isn't about rehab. It had more to do with what we call reconditioning or performance training. So that was what we targeted, and that's how I started doing things. That led to working with uh, England Rugby because I met someone that was working with England Rugby. So from there, I spent a lot of time with England Rugby. Um, going over there to work, they send athletes over. A lot of premiership soccer teams from England and so forth. A lot of ski racers, basketball, some hockey players, a golfer, one, you know. And uh, I wasn't working through the bad times. So, um, uh, or now the worst, the worst almost. So what we're looking at is my, my, my spectrum of experience, 20 years, was from nothing, okay, still now to a small little training center. I go into team training environments. So as I talk to you, I know what a team training environment is. It's not a posh little 1v1 situation that I'm operating in all the time. This isn't a posh facility, that's for sure. It's just a very basic type situation that I utilize, okay? Does this athlete lift weights? Yes, he lifts weights, okay? He definitely lift weights. I'm very pro on the strength training side of things, power development. But there's lots of different ways to get strong, okay? So most recently, I spent talking and trying to educate a lot of doctors and a lot of therapists and a lot of trainers as to what they don't know as far as rehabilitation is concerned. And from this group, I think it's important to say is that what they don't know anything about typically is, is performance training or strength training and conditions, okay? So with that being said, we'll move on. That athlete was a World Cup um, rugby player from Scotland. That was four years ago. And all that video is from three to 3.5 months post-op ACL reconstruction. So that started at three, and, and then over two weeks, he was at 3.5 months ACL reconstruction. That's what we were doing with him. Okay? Because we could. You can't do that with every athlete, but I could do that with that athlete. All right? I wanted you to see that clip. I didn't want you to know that he was post-op ACL. Everything wasn't perfect. But it's very progressive, and it oftentimes just looks like a good functional training camp that he's doing, okay, and so forth. But he's at 3.5 ACL, um, or 3.5 months post-op ACL. He didn't start playing until nine months, okay? We had that luxury because it went through the summer and so forth, the off-season. But he didn't start playing until nine months. He's played four years, he played in another World Cup, he's been asymptomatic in that knee, he hasn't had any problems, okay? This is how this goes, and why was I doing that type of work with him? We do want to make him a better football playing, soccer playing, basketball playing athlete, okay? That's ultimately what we're trying to achieve in a rehab reconditioning process, a better athlete, <coughs> and potentially, I say, a better basketball player, okay? Because there's a lot of things involved in whether it's soccer or basketball, American football, whatever it might be. There's a lot of different things to say, a better performer and so forth. Okay, sorry about that. In high performance sports, where I basically hang on the most of the time, right? We need to strive for a better soccer player, a better football player, a better basketball player. Not just enough to say a better athlete, but actually try to improve their skills during this off time. That's what we should be striving for all the time. As a performance team, we should have control of that. Now, Everything I try to share with you guys, it is based off of evidence-based medicine, the science that's out there. But the reality is there's a huge part of the art and the science coming together. We all have massive experience, and evidence can't support everything we're doing. We should be doing some things, as long as we're not screwing them up, that is ahead of the curve. That's the art. That's coaching. That's pushing. That's learning. And science is supposed to catch up and support a lot of those things. We have to know the science. But we have to know where else we can be doing things that the science isn't teaching us about yet. I was having a good discussion earlier, like a lot of the soft tissue skills that are out there. There's not a lot of science necessarily, or supported science, on what soft tissue work can do. Yet the results are there. They're clearly there. So I call it a return to competition strategy, not a return to play. All right? Return to play is getting back to, say, team training. Return to play is what young high school kids might do. They're playing again. But in elite sport or high performance, division one, professional, whatever it might be, it's returned to competition. Most injuries are occurring in competition. All right? So we have to prepare for the ultimate goal, not just getting them back close enough, 
but getting them back for the highest level. So I choose to reuse the term return to competition. But it's easy to get them back, guys. Very easy. We must come up with ways to keep them back. So continue to compete strategies is what we're really after. When this the process starts, immediate post-injury, the process of a continue to compete strategy should be put into place. All right? Joint compromise after. If you've had a knee injury, a hip injury, an ankle injury, a back injury, if it's a joint related problem, you are now a joint compromised athlete. There's a problem. It will never be the same. All right? Are there any surgeons in here? Because it will never be the same. All right? Even if they fix it, they do a very good job in stabilizing things and fixing things that way. We ultimately finish it off, but it'll never be the same. Low compromised athlete. The reason I use this is because not all our, uh, injuries are joint related. It can be tendon, muscle, right, soft tissue related. But I also use the term low because once we start getting along the cycle and we start to reintroduce an athlete back to training, monitoring load is a good thing to do. So much of the GPS and accelerometer programs that are out there and what they're wearing monitors load. Okay, that's a good, that's why we use a load compromised athlete is something that possibly the coaches, the performance uh, directors, the performance people on the field, they monitor load for a guy who's had an injury. Load can also be, from the same perspective, um, intensity by time and things like that, what our classic what load could be as well. So it doesn't matter whether it's an accelerometer load, whether it's load in your programming, it doesn't matter really. It is, once they are one of these things, they're gonna stay that, okay? They're always a load compromised athlete, therefore, return to competition strategies must be implemented on a regular basis. So a freshman, because we have some college coaches and things like that, a freshman who blows their knee out, it's a four year plan to keep this kid playing. It's not get him back to play. It's not get him back to the next season. It's what is the strategy to get four years out of this athlete. If it's a professional athlete, many models are typically oftentimes a four year model, three, four year model. You don't get a pro athlete and say, we're developing a 10 year model for this guy, because they're either retired, hurt, or traded or something, okay? 